All right, guys, welcome back to Unhinged. We are taping this in the garden office. So if you hear some background noise, it's because we can't close our windows anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't have any money to fix it, and the university won't fix it for us. So, Because we're entirely funded by Sam whispering at Alea. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Because, yeah, well, we're... Anyways, it's, anyway, cold. it's cold in here. <laughs> it's so cold. Honestly, fuck the wind. It wouldn't be that bad if, like, we didn't get, like, the marine layer. Like, I feel like I shouldn't be moist and cold. And we're talking about something completely different than the weather yeah, right now. Yeah, it should be moist and really, really hot, babe. All right, let's get into it. Um, By the way, my name is Chris. I'm the opinion yeah. editor. Yeah, and I'm Marcus. I'm the managing editor. I'm the sane one in this relationship. Oh, oh. Oh, honey. <laughs> um, so let's get into it. We have three stories, a column that yours truly wrote, um, a main and a secondary. Which one do you want to start with? I feel like because the main and your column are kind of connected, let's start with the secondary. Yeah, let's do that. Um, I was just now, like, as I opened this page up in front of me, I was like, wow, you can tell I'm the editor because, like, all of this looks like something I would write. In terms of content, like, I feel like I am pushing it. You know what I mean? Like, pushing it more towards my shtick. Like, I'm with the food co-op, which is He has vegan. an agenda. <laughs> I have an agenda. Like, I don't know. These pictures are... Maybe I'm just, like, so college liberal cliche, but, like, these are all things that, like, I was like, yeah, I'd write that. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's a fair point. You know my shtick. Like, yeah. These kind of seem like things like that. Like, I don't know. Anyway, so... Uh, so, the secondary. The secondary. It's called a meaty solution to UCSD's carbon footprint. It's by Emily Collins. She's one of our newer editorial assistants here at Opinion. Um, and so, do you want to give them the spiel of what it is, or should I? Well, she d she discusses um, you see so UCSD's carbon footprint and the initiative um, to basically just move to renewable energies and kind of examines how HDH and um, the food industry, not necessarily the food industry, but like what we eat here at UC San Diego affects that um, that goal, that perspective. Um, she focuses kind of on, on meat, but also takes it to a more general level. And that's about it. And she her claim is that UCSD and HDH, if they're really committed to a sustainable uh, and renewable energies, then they should also um, educate students about eating and thinking about the environment better and also provide the students where better options than there are now. Yeah, one of the important points that actually got cut um, <laughs> was that, you know, UCSD has so much leverage to educate people, obviously, because they're a school, but they can educate people just via the, like, implicit policies that they put in place. And one of the points that she mentioned was that you know, like all of the stocking is done based on what sells, not necessarily what's going to like be healthy for people. Yeah. So we're, t we're talking about markets here yeah, mostly. Markets, yeah. So yeah, if like, let's say Coca-Cola, they do a lot of business with Coca-Cola, like they might sell a bunch of Coke, but you know, are they going to sell like this, like organic apple juice? Yeah, and and by the way, like the news just broke a few, a few couple of days ago that, um, the new contract with Coca-Cola would probably impact the fact that we're moving to a uh, mm -hmm. bottle-less campus, yeah. basically. So that's another kind of wrench. In, uh, yeah, in there's the a plan. lot of wrenches in UCSD's goal to be uh, yeah. trash-free and carbon neutral or whatever by 2025 or even 2050. It's a good it's a good goal to start with, obviously. Yeah. But They're not doing very good at working towards it, though. It's like, oh, we can have more money yeah. doing this, so let's just do that instead. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are some, like, other kind of more, like, I don't want to say, like, less mainstream ways that they're trying to do it. But they're not advertising that the things that they are doing. And the things that they are doing are, like, maybe more symptoms than they are, like, solutions. So one of the things is that they have, like, a microgrid that kind of creates some electricity for them. They are trying to move their vehicles more towards, like, electric as opposed to alternative fuels. Or, I mean, as opposed to, like, uh, shit fuels. Dead dinosaurs and bones and shit such. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, natural gas. That's the word. I could not think of natural yes. gas. Um, which is weird because I love fart jokes. Am I right? Well, it's really funny because it's like I'm not. I'm really not the person to ask for like fart word jokes. suggestions. 
No, not <laughs> anyways. Um, another another well another point that she makes repeatedly is the like the the meat industry, right? Um, yeah. it's, and it's terrible. Yeah, and I kind of wanted to comment on on it, but like she kind of explained it not completely. It just didn't fit in the piece, but the fact that UCSD has and we've covered that before, like has some sort of options for vegetarian meals, uh, but really not that much. They have Roots, which is like the only really like vegan slash vegetarian place on campus. They opened the, the sorry, more like healthy eating options like in PC mm-hmm. and stuff like that. But really like the, the, the array of options when you take out the markets, which is basically, you know, they sell some fruits and some stuff. Some, yeah. Oh, that was one of my first pieces here at The Guardian. That they it was about food. like how to reorganize those. Oh yeah, and yeah. And it it, it kind of comes back, right? It's like every time we have this discussion, it's like, oh, the Trident Food Pantry didn't do that before either because it's like so hard to, to to sell those uh, perishable yeah. goods and stuff like that. But it's also by stocking up on um, on foods that are, that are not necessarily good for the environment. You're also going against your your goal of being. Uh, uh, sus- like a st- sustainable campus basically right and that's that's the that's the ideal and there's other there's other things of course that contribute to um uh like co2 emissions and all that kind of stuff mm-hmm. global warming etc but that's like one of the things which is like it's hard to to see that UCSD is making an effort when they're also actively going like literally in the wrong direction mm-hmm. on so many of those things it's like that whole that whole contract with coca-cola is just like yeah like yeah, of course they don't want you to not sell them their bottles. Yeah. Like if you sign a contract with them, and then uh, that's like a multi million, mil- sorry, multi million dollar contract, mm-hmm. and that just every time you you think that we're going in the right direction, there's just something that's like, oh, you know what? Like we can kind of like get to that point later on. You know, yeah. it's just pushing it back and 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 back more and more. We well, you know UCSD students know a lot about procrastinating. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but like and that's kind of sad because you know, we have we we're kind of like we're really lucky to have the environment that we have and we also you know, we have a like great like a marine biology uh department stuff like that where you know a lot of um people around here study the oceans and that that idea that we're like some somehow still kind of connected to nature and that we're like openly like claiming that we're like which is like bullshit. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, it's just like it's sad because there's so many so many resources here that you're just like in like in and around San Diego and it's just I don't know. There's there's so much more that could be done. Yeah, I feel like when it comes to like environmental issues on this campus, like the tendency is for people to say oh well at least we're doing it better than some campuses or better than some institutions and like you know we're doing it better than humble defunct you know alabama yeah and like we're doing a good job but that doesn't mean that like we can't be open to criticism and like open to improvement on the shit that we do yeah yeah so yeah i mean like she was saying like this does talk a lot about me and like how terrible it is for the environment just be it like the this many animals congregating and shitting everywhere that's bad or transport of meat it's another thing um just the the slaughterhouses and the factory type of uh aspect that goes into industrial agriculture yeah that's also bad so there's so many different things that contribute to the way that like food also contributes to our uh our carbon footprint yeah and that's like one of the like implicit arguments here is that like we have so much leverage, we have so much authority in this area that to ignore this facet of our carbon footprint is just like negligible mm-hmm. or negligent, excuse me. Yeah. So I don't know. I feel like the main, the main point I took away from it, at least reading it was like the, when she mentions education, you know, like we're obviously like a university, a college. So we're, we're getting an education here, but that's true that like, it's not necessarily something that you talk about a lot. Uh, and I know, like, half the people would be like, oh, yeah, like, we don't care about that. We don't need to le- to learn about it. But it's it's an interesting, like, concept to be like, you know what? Those are things that you're eating. You should, you should mm-hmm. know about, like, where they're from and what the impact is. And maybe instead of eating red meat three times a week, you can eat it two, two times or one time. It's not, it's not like anybody is... 
is like nobody is like pushing an agenda here or anything it's just like being like be environmentally conscious of the decisions you make and then you can make a choice if you want to keep eating what you eat then fine but you know like just be aware. being aware of what is going on and what your decision uh like what impact your decision has and i think that that was like that was a really really interesting point yeah yeah definitely something that she talks about is like you know you can be environmentally conscious and that you know what you're contributing to the carbon footprint here but it doesn't mean you necessarily have to like give up anything that contributes anything to carbon footprint yeah but like you know conscientious consumption is like a thing and it's something that we should all kind of strive for and it's like very bare minimums even if it's like you know you have a burger once a week maybe make it once every two weeks or if you eat red meat all the time then you're just gonna die at 30 so yeah. don't worry about it you're you're gone anyway <laughs> You know what I mean? So just, you know, one, it's better for your health if you get this kind of like outside of class education on food and how it impacts you and how it impacts the, the rest of the world. But it's also, you know, like a significant issue. It's not just how you as an individual are going to be affected, but how the rest of us are affected. Mm -hmm. So conscientious, conscientious consumption is the general overarching theme of this one. Even yeah. It's a hard thing to say. Yeah. Say conscientious consumption five times fast. No. Okay. So uh, let's let's move else? on. <laughs> no, I'm good. <laughs> let's move on. Do you want to do you want to do the main and I'll I'll just do my column last. Um, let's do your column next because I think your oh. column actually, all like, right, has some context that's good for the main. Okay. Yeah. Um, tell us tell us the shtick. So I struggled mightily writing this column, and not for the reasons that I struggle normally, where it's just like being a bad writer. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's mostly like I can get 300 words out of anything, mm -hmm. but then there's like a there's like a time where that 300 stretches to 700 and finding that sweet spot in the middle is just like kind of hard. But this one was mostly like like you said it was like a an organization problem because there's so many like components. Um so mostly basically what caught my attention last week was that uh Poland passed laws regulations uh, were put into effect by the new president. That basically outlawed anyone saying, um, yeah, Poland was not responsible for the Holocaust. Um, oh, sorry, outlawed anyone saying Poland was responsible for the Holocaust. Um, and then that kind of was like, you know, I took history in high school. I took history and I learned about World War Two and Poland, Poland, even though they were occupied by Germany, Poland. most definitely was responsible Poland. Poland, so cute. Poland, yeah. <laughs> Poland. But it sounds like you're saying pollen, so like flowers are contributing to the Holocaust. Poland. That's Poland. How you, that's how you say it in German. That's why it's, Poland. it's very confusing. Um, but so that they they were most definitely like responsible for at least at least part of it, uh, complicit in a sense. And so then I went back and um tied it back to what happened in Charlottesville basically and whatever happened last uh, last year uh, over over the the course of the year since Donald Trump's election and compare that to how Germany dealt with the after uh, math of World War II when it comes to white supremacists basically which for the interest of the piece I just called neo-nazis because mm -hmm. that's what they are um and so, like the main from this week, it ended up touching on what freedom of speech means here and what freedom of speech means in other, not not necessarily that like I kind of like tiptoed around it, but that's that's but that's mostly what it what it came to because what Germany decided to do after World War Two was uh, what they call defensive democracy, which is basically saying you know what you guys are free to say whatever you want, but when it comes to this particular very very horrible part of our history anybody who brings it up and glorifies it or whatever is just gonna suffer the consequences that's basically how they went about it and um and it was it, it was an interesting part uh because i personally grew up in germany i went to uh oh you seem surprised <laughs> oh are you european oh uh, what what uh so i lived in germany for eight years and i did i did go to school um there for a little bit and part of the part of the history lessons were about world war ii and part of the way the history was taught was that you know germany was responsible germany did all these terrible things and that was at least in in recent years that's something that 
Germany has been like not necessarily vocal about, but like in uh, the in their teaching of what happened, they're like, yeah, we were the ones at fault. And that's something that you kind of never see here in the United States, where it's just like when you talk about the Civil War, it was just like, oh, yeah, yeah. by the way, slavery was at stake. And you just kind of like, yeah. Thing, yeah, like, yeah, like all of the people who like lost that war from the South, there were not all of them, but most of the big generals and stuff like that. And even that one, I think one of the generals like ended up being president of the United States, right? Wasn't that? Grant or something? Anyways, am I wrong? I feel like I'm wrong. Okay, just scratch that. I don't. I don't know. You're looking Neither at me I. like I'm crazy. I... Um, but like, so it, the story about the Civil War is just that it's North versus South. But yeah. like, the, the the real story here is that most of these people were slave owners, and um, even deep into the 20th century, with all the laws and um and stuff like that, like these people were basically white supremacists in a sense um to an extent and the fact that americans are not talking about it makes it all the more like dangerous in a sense that now neo-nazis and white supremacists are like picking up steam after uh, the election of donald trump because we all saw what happened in 1939 after that you know that wave of uh, white supremacism uh, went through Europe, we had a world war, and that's that's so that's the point of of my um, uh, of my column, just examining that. Um, I mean, yeah, that's it. I'm I'm calling on the American government to change the constitution, I guess. But <laughs> um, what I think, like, was by far like the most like nuanced and like interesting thing to take away from this was the defensive democracy thing. Yeah. Because like one word that you use numerous times in describing like how America handles like its history of racism and slavery was the word dangerous. And I yeah. feel like that's one of those things like the idea of a defensive democracy, I feel like the word dangerous can come up on both sides, you know what I mean? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So 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 yeah. So either right. sorry, go ahead. Oh, I mean that's just just what makes it so so interesting is that one, it's dangerous to pretend that your country has done nothing wrong and to, like, kind of choose to propagate some, like, very nationalistic message uh, about your country and its history. And th that, like, has very lasting effects on, like, the way that we raise our children. Yeah. And I feel like the best example of that is, you know, I think it was, like, 2013 or something. Texas tried to, like, completely redo their textbooks to, like, have a very favorable impression of America. Yeah. And, like, could you imagine growing up in Texas uh, with those as your textbooks? Where, like, you say slavery was a thing, but you, like... You don't take responsibility for it, and you don't say, like... I, or you just say that, like, the Civil War was an issue of states' rights. Yeah, which and, it like, definitely wasn't. And, like, everything else. Which it definitely wasn't. So, so, yeah, it's dangerous to kind of, one, prop up this, like, super nationalist message because it's better for your country and, like, people will be more, like, behind you that way. But it's also dangerous, you know because it's like not accurate it's like revisionist history like yeah there's a lot of potential in warping history um and like dangerous on the other side of that is that you know i don't trust the government to tell me what i can and can't say like that's like when i saw that i didn't know that was a thing that that was like a an actual policy of theirs was kind of i knew it was like you know kind of illegal to have like the paraphernalia but i didn't yeah. know it was illegal to kind of be just like open denial. Yeah, so so you can't you can't go in public until very recently the um, uh, Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf book was not being published in Germany. Um, you can't have any Nazi propaganda. Um, any like you can't say um, the double H Heil uh, in public. That is, and that like very strongly enforced. And that doesn't mean that there's no like extreme like right-wing movement in germany because there is mm -hmm. but like i saw an interesting thing that said like one of the founders of a right-wing party in germany mentioned the nazis in a fa favorable way and he got booted from his own party mm -hmm. because there's plenty of issues in in europe right now and don't get me wrong like with immigration and xen uh, xenophobic uh, tendencies and all that but you know like at least in that in that in that um, respect uh, regarding World War Two and what is the one version of history that 
everybody should know in that sense germany is like actually got ahead of it and was like we don't want this to ever happen again um and that's that's why i'm calling the other side of it dangerous because obviously you can make the argument especially here in the united states that having the government tell you like you can't tell that is not it's anti-constitutional um but on the other hand the last time that happened and the government didn't do anything we had a war and that's kind of that's kind of how i see it um and obviously i'm not american so it's like my interpretation of i guess the constitution is very very different because it's not just not how i was raised but to protect a democracy you know f sometimes you have to make some of these decisions um and i would argue that a lot of those kind of democracies are better than whatever democracy is here in the united states um in that in the sense that it doesn't put people in danger uh, of being targeted for their race or whatever um i mean i could i could talk more about that but that's basically that's that's actually a very good tie-in to the main. Yeah, let's let's move on to the main. Yeah. So the main is called uh, Taking Hate Speech Off Its Platform. I thought the, the little cartoon was very cute. No? Okay, cool. Anyway, um, the idea is that this is by Jacob Sutherland. He's a contributing writer here at Opinion. Um, what he writes about is that, um, you know, there are a bunch of, you know, opinions on either side of the political spectrum that go... Uh, how far you so choose down either side. But mainstream media has like a particular responsibility to filter some things. And so he focuses on like arguments that kind of push these very niche fringe extremist groups into the limelight, even though like by and large they're not supported just for the sake of like news eye catching like headlines. So, um, yeah, so the the idea is that, you know, there's, like, a, a particular responsibility that's, like, implicit to journalism that you don't prop up something you know is, like, harmful to people because it'll get you, like, attention. Uh, uh, the trait. Uh, uh. What do you think about that? And I feel like that's, uh, like I was saying, your piece is a good tie into that because yours is, like, historical context for this argument. Yeah. That, you know, propping up a particular idea because it's... I don't know, you're trying to maintain some like particular idealistic image of democracy. Yeah. Um, it's dangerous, like to an extent, like based on the situation, it's dangerous to say that, you know, having neo-Nazis given a platform is okay. Like that's something that like we should know by and large as a, a collective that's like not an idea that we want to Yeah, it humanize. killed millions of people. Yeah giving nazis a platform literally killed millions yeah. of people like people need to just like yeah. recognize that and be like this is not okay um i i don't know if i saw this online or if i just talked to someone about it but it was like that idea that the constitution was written you know 300 years ago mm -hmm. i guess 240 50. take yeah 40 take or leave it um in that at least the the what is it the first ten amendments, yeah that those haven't really changed in two hundred fifty years, which you know you can say it's fine, but also two hundred fifty years ago slavery was fine. Yeah, yeah we still have like quartering in our. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and that that is one of the things that this is about. It's like I feel like America is very, very afraid of change when it comes to this, and freedom of speech is definitely that that one issue that everybody just gets riled up again. Uh, against um well one of the things that he argues in this piece is that it's not really a freedom of speech issue to say that mainstream media should not go out and look for a neo-nazis interview what he's saying is that yeah um, they shouldn't give them a platform yeah one he's saying they shouldn't give them a platform and two it's not like uh it's not violating their first amendment right to free speech because they're like no we don't want to put you on the air like just because you have the right to say everything doesn't mean i have the like obligation to yeah, make sure you reach as many people as that uh, nobody is like it. nobody is forcing them to give yeah. those people a platform yeah. um no one's forcing them and they have like a particular obligation to not do that 
if they think like this idea is going to be harmful to people to not propagate something and obviously that like in an extreme way that can lead to bias and like the way that like news can be portrayed can be very influenced if we like take that very much to the extreme yeah but for things that are like axiomatically like not good for any society um unless you're in these groups yeah maybe don't maybe because like political discourse as he says here can still exist without fringe hate groups on either side yeah and then it it goes to a like an editorial responsibility kind of question where it's Mm -hmm. just like each media company is always going to have its own opinion about things. You know, you're you're not going to tell Breitbart that they can't interview neo-Nazis because they're just going to do it. Um, but when it comes to making that decision, then you have to, like, realize that uh, that actually, you know, shines a light on your company and shines a light on you. And a lot of, um, like, for the New York Times, for example, I, I know we were discussing that uh, maybe a week ago, but... A week ago, a week ago. The fact that they like they offered that platform to a lot of people on the fringe of the politi- political spectrum is maybe they're trying to they think they're trying to do the right thing, but it's also becoming a place where maybe you're not feeling as um I don't know how to say it say this without sounding like someone who's going to be like offended by any and like every little thing but i think i think you get what i mean though that it's just like it's just like you expect the new york times to be like straightforward and not publicize yeah. someone saying like all jews need to leave the country basically that's kind of like the idea of it um yeah. by the way america like america, getting back explain. yeah explain explain to me why you were like fighting the nazis in the second world war and are now like okay with them being here and yeah. openly could you imagine if this was like 1940 and like this same documentary that he references here about like this woman who went around to like neo-nazis like, yeah the neo-nazi groups like could you imagine that being put out in like 19 that is crazy oh, to me th- she'd be dead She's yeah dead. that's the thing yeah. N- not only that but also like like america has a history of like you know, like, oh, you're Japanese, like, you're from Japan, like, we're gonna put you in camps. Oh, you're a communist, we're gonna, like, take care of you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And now, like, not even 70 years after World War Two, they just are like, oh, neo-Nazis, meh. Yeah, I mean, well, we have our particular issues with race and no, uh, that's true. white supremacy, yeah. and I feel like neo-Nazis speak more to that cultural tendency towards racism. Uh, yeah, they do to like the the original like Nazi regime. Do you know what I mean? No, no, that's that's definitely true. We call them neo Nazis, but they're just, I mean, they're, yeah, I they're mean, horrible, like, obviously. But yeah, it's but more it's like of a, like white people over everything. It's more like white supremacists than neo Nazis were white America. Yeah, and yeah. that's that's another problem. Yeah. All identity it's, Europa is typing on. up a, a letter to the editor. <laughs> to right the editor. Now. <laughs> I'm gonna have to get um, twenty seven. But yeah, so well, the, I I think this piece was really interesting. I I had to like kind of like challenge uh jacob in the, in the comments i was just i was just asking him like are you sure that that's what you want to publish because i wasn't trying to like moderate it yeah yeah because i 100 percent agree with everything he wrote yeah. um but i i, I did want to make sure that you know he knew that his name would be put on this because this is such a like controversial issue and like especially when you read through his conclusion where it's just like United States is grounded in the principle that everyone is created equal. Oh, contentious. contentious. <laughs> With that in mind, if we're going to pride ourselves on this facet, then we must not allow opinions that take away this fundamental freedom from anyone. And then he concludes with, we owe it to those who have been marginalized to create a news media environment that holds no room for opinions rooted, rooted yeah. in hate. The issue with this piece is that you can take just about every other line and make it in like an extreme statement that's the thing and, and I, it sounds crazy yeah and i was just like you need to make sure that this is what you want yeah. and he, he was okay with it but i was just like that's like yeah like this is this is pretty out there in the sense that yes he's right or at least i think I he's agree. right but, but it could be taken so far. exactly that's the thing so th- that was a really like it was an interesting piece to edit um i think he wrote it really well too um and yeah, like you said, like you have to read it as a whole to understand. Yeah. We're, we're not saying just if you, cut the legs off of everybody. We're just saying, you know, like if you're the New York Times, be the New York Times. Don't be Breitbart. Yeah. 
basically. And if you're Breitbart, just okay. go in a hole Do it, and whatever. die. Just know that you're shitty. <laughs> and that we don't like you. Down with Breitbart. Um, World Form Window? Sure. The World Form Window. Tweeting! I, what? It's tweeting. It's tweeting. It's I tweet this was season. Very cute when I saw it. Yeah. I like the little Twitter storm in the background. Yeah. Get it? Twitter storm. That's like a series of. I don't have Twitter, but I I've heard the expression Twitter storm. Tweet storm. Twitter. There's there's a tornado <laughs> with the Twitter symbol all over it, and it's spinning around. Um. Can you think of that vine with that potato that flew around? <laughs> yeah. A Twitter storm flew around my room. Great vine. Great song, too. The actual song that it's referencing. Frank Ocean, killing it. Shout can, out to Frank Ocean. Can we move on? <laughs> okay. Well, Marcus, why do you hate black people and gay people? Racism and homophobia. I'm not going to comment it here first. on this. Um, so why is it breaking news that the president makes passive-aggressive tweets? Some, someone asks. The other person answers. Uh... Some say it's the increasing oh, yeah, globalization the bubble, <laughs> via the internet, social media. But you know, it's most likely he uses his social media in such a divisive way, especially when compared to not only other political figures and Obama. This isn't really so much a comment, just a, just a talk. Just it's statement. a little TED talk. Also, um, divisive is spelled wrong here. It's spelled yeah, wrong here. We need that's to, fine. We need to. It's a it's a cute cartoon. We need to check. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I'm with this first guy. It's not really breaking news. It's so mundane at this point that he's saying something. The ridiculous. only problem is that like now that it's like his only way of communicating with us, because when you see like those press conferences, you're just like, yeah, it's how just, how are journalists supposed to like know anything that's going on? Because literally all they do is like, oh, yeah. And then just like don't tell you anything. Yeah. So like the only source of information comes from Donald Trump's Twitter. And that's 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 an issue, by the way. Yeah. That's that's a yeah. problem, and that uh, you leaks. know. Don't forget leaks. And leaks, but you should like we should be holding the the communication, whoever takes care of communication at the White House, uh, more accountable for. Well, it's it's. I mean, if I was a journalist, I wouldn't really know what to do with it either. If you oh, ask I'm so many saying. questions, yeah, and then, like she's and they just, just like, don't they just don't wall you. That's the problem. Yeah, it's no, just like sure. their generic propaganda that they pre prepared and yeah. decided at you. And that's, like, kind of what every communications director does for the White House. But, like, at least some people are, like, actually able to tell you something. Well, you understand that, obviously, they have to filter out yeah. what information, like, you get. And and then they have to, like, filter I, him out because he's an <laughs> idiot. But it's, like, I don't necessarily agree with it, but I still understand it. Yeah. But the fact to, like, you know, like, not say anything, that becomes a problem because you're just – you're allowed – more, like – you're entitled to getting information and getting uh, updates from what is going on with the president and what is going on with the government and all this thing. And when, you know, like when the press secretary of the White House doesn't know or doesn't want to say or doesn't even give you anything, like, useful to rely on, then... As a journalist, obviously, you can't do your job. But then also as the American people, you... You can't do your like civic duty to yeah. like, be informed. You can't do your life because yeah. you don't know what's going on. That that's 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 the problem. That's the. I mean, I yeah. know nothing ever seems to really hurt him anymore because he's kind of just down to like his radicalized base of supporters. But like realistically, not sharing any information except via tweets and leaks should be the end of your presidency. Like I'm not saying impeach him because he has leaks, but like. Like, could you imagine if Obama's main source of communicating with people was Twitter and leaking? Obama was so good at communicating too. Ugh. That was such. That was like uh, such the a best thing. relationship is with Obama. Let's go back to our ex. Let's go back to our ex. Let's go back to yeah. Lucky Michelle. Let's go back to that period where I'm gonna hold America was in crisis, but at least they had Obama. Now America's in crisis and they have Trump. Ugh. America's in crisis because we have Trump. <laughs> Not only, but yeah, yeah, mostly. It's been exacerbated. It's been it's been quite a ride. Yeah, Trump's Trump's dipped his toes in some some divisiveness, perhaps. Wiggled his toe around, maybe peed on it. Uh, no, wait, no mind. He had the divisiveness pee on him. You good? Any other dumb comments? I really hope that. <laughs> oh God! I really hope that dossier <laughs> is true, though. 
I am still, I feel like they found out, like, I feel like I was reading something or watching something on the news, and they're like, yeah, this, this dossier was, like, funded by this person, therefore it can't be credible. But I was like, ah, oh, rats. I really hope this story about this hooker peeing on him was true. Because um. that sounds hot. Well, not hot. That sounds wild. Definitely not hot. I feel like one piss play, come on. But also, Donald Trump is so heavy. That's just like a walrus flopping around in a shower. You know what I mean? Sure. Do you know those like slip and slides where they yeah. like, oh, you like would run the hose through and it would like fill up and then like as like pressure rose, it would like spray up and like have like a sprinkler like yeah. all the way down the path. I'm picturing that, but with P and Donald Trump going down it. I think we're going to like just, I'm going to start clipping like the last two minutes of our podcast and just putting them all together. We'll do like a special podcast. It'll be, it'll be Chris talking about peeing Donald Trump for five hours. I will not pee on him. Well, <laughs> I mean, given that opportunity, I'm, I'm going to cut you not off like right there. Let's, way. let's just stop. But like, it just let's, feels let's like, save the you know, like small dignity about, like, you still have. Grave. Like, I'd pee on Trump. Okay. I want to see what his hair's like wet. Are you good? Yeah, I'm fine. All right. Okay. Uh, Bye. We'll, yeah, we'll be back next week. Catch you later.